Namaskar. Today we have a very important session of uh, for the poetry, which is uh, organized and moderated by Sukrita Pal Kumar and Vinita Agrawal. Uh, the theme of the subject is that respecting the page. Is it okay, uh, Sukrita? Yeah. Uh, so, yes. uh, and we have two guests from from America and one from West Bengal. So, Sukrita and Vinita, I am hand overing this um, stage to you, and I am inviting those po uh, those uh, poets, and you take care of it. In between, when I feel that I have some question, I will come back to you. Thank you very welcome. much. Take yeah, care. Welcome. Thank you, Thank you Rati. Thank you very much, Rati. Um, I think we are very fortunate that uh, we have this lovely forum. Which is um, which has been given to us by Rati Saxena, as you all know, and this comes under the species of what she calls Kritya Poetry Movement. I think all of us poets are thrilled with the idea that there is a movement in poetry, and there is a certain kind of activism that seems to be, uh, you know, uh, showing up out here. And uh, Bindita and I have been very excited about this, and uh, we decided that at least once a month we should have a program called Ruminating Poetry, where we take up different aspects of um, uh, writing poetry, appreciating poetry, and we discuss that with uh, not just amongst ourselves, Vinita and I, but we have a dialogue with um, uh, you know, poets from India and different languages, as well as poets from abroad. And uh, today is actually, we had our inaugural session last time where, where we were really just basically talking about the concept of what this uh, uh, series of programs is going to be like. And it's not a question of teaching poetry, it's not a question of giving lectures, but it's a question of really exposing ourselves to different dimensions of art and craft of poetry, what goes into the aesthetics of writing poetry, appreciating poetry, listening to poetry, what are the various, um, what is a poem? And some very basic questions related to the craft and the consciousness that we have or the lack of consciousness that we have in trying to understand as to how to write a poem. So all of us have been writing poetry for a long time and we are well seasoned in one sense, but not all of us are very good at articulating or even understanding consciously as to what we are doing. And I don't know if the mystery is ever going to be demystified. It's always going to look like some great mystery because, and yet we are trying to engage with it we are trying to engage with the idea of what is a poem, what is writing poetry. Long time ago, I think it was about nearly 25 years ago, the first time I wrote uh, an article which um, came out in India International Center's quarterly, which was called Becoming Literature. And I struggled very hard to try to work out what is a creative process. And today I'm at the same point. I don't think I have unraveled everything to myself. However, so that is why I thought Vinita and I, we have been conceptualizing different kinds of programs over this whole idea of ruminating poetry. So today, uh, welcome to Subod Sarkar and welcome to Seth Michelson. And I think both of you are going to be our main guests today, Vinita. And um, uh, Vinita and I will be on the periphery, more on the periphery than even Rati, who said she's going to be totally on the periphery. So we are going to be listening to you for about 10 minutes each, if you can speak. And then uh, our the subject of today's discussion is respecting the page. And first, before we get into that, I would like to let me um, introduce uh, uh, Seth Michelson first, and then Vinita, if you can take over and introduce Subod, and so that both of us um, are there, but in the background. But uh, Seth, your, your bio data is so intimidating. It's so long. Uh, but I'm going to read parts of it. And obviously, you're a very, very accomplished poet, and also, you know, 
poet. That's just a poet, but an award-winning poet and a translator and a professor of poetry and what else? I don't know. But yeah, that's hidden behind uh, these words. So, and we know that you've published about 16 books of original poetry, poetry in translation, also an anthology. And uh, your book, Eyes Like Broken Windows, what a beautiful title, won the poetry category of the International Book Awards. And your work also has, in fact, appeared widely around the world in translation and surprisingly, surprisingly in many Indian languages as well. Hindi, Tamil, Malayalam, and then, of course, continental languages, Serbian, uh, Spanish, and also Vietnamese. You are yourself an active translator. And um, also you've done certain, I mean, I noticed that you've been writing and publishing poetry. In fact, publishing poetry and uh, encouraging poetry, um, uh, you know, from all over, uh, particularly marginalized people in particular. And uh, I appreciate the fact that, uh, you know, you have this, uh, you published Women of the Big Sky. And this was the first ever single single author book of poetry in English language translation by a female Mapuche poet. Is that how you pronounce? Uh, from territorial Argentina. And you've published poetry from children in the most restrictive maximum security immigration detention center in the U.S. And your, this poetry has been also set to music by four different composers. Iraq, an Iraqi painter has also painted responses to uh, this poetry. And Michelson, uh, Seth Michelson, you have generous, generously been honored with the NEA Fellowship, Anna Davidson Rosenberg Award, Patterson Poetry Prize, Pushcart Prize nominations, nationally, internationally, in radio, you are on television, media, appearing recently. Oh my God, it just goes on forever. I'll skip some of this, otherwise the whole time we'll be only introducing you. And then, of course, you uh, have been going everywhere, receiving a whole lot of um, attention by poetry, listeners of poetry. And you are also extensively being acclaimed for your academic research, including getting awards from such institutions as the Mellon Foundation and the American Studies Association. Welcome to our program. And this, of course, the program, if this particular session is going to be respecting the page. I hand over uh, the mic to you now, um, Vinita. Thank you, Sukrita, for that wonderful introduction of Seth and the introduction of uh, today's session. Um, I will introduce uh, Subodh Sarkar, who, is, who has a no less intimidating bio. After I've introduced Subodh, I will just say a few words about our session today that may act like a diving board to just, you know, for our for the actual talks to begin with Seth Michelson and Subodh Zarkar. To introduce Subodh, Sahitya Academy Award winner, Subodh Sarkar has participated in several international seminars and readings in France, Greece, USA, Czech Republic, Russia, Taiwan, Canada, and India. Edited and guest edited Indian literature. He has published 34 books of poems in Bengali and four books of essays and translations in English. Recipient, at, recipient of Bongo Bhushan from the government of West Bengal, D.Lit Honoris Causa from Gorbanga University and Vidya Sagar University, Gangadhar Meher National Award for Poetry from Sambalpur University, 2016. He is now the president of State Kobita Academy, Government of West Bengal, Fulbright Fellow for 2016-17. He taught post-colonial literature in the University of Iowa and participated in the IWP at Iowa, USA. He heads the Department of English in City College, Calcutta University, Kolkata. That's a word, Sarkar, for you. So today's session, as we all know, is titled Respecting the Page. So I just wanted to put across this little thought uh, as a kind of an opener to the session, that the page is essentially a neutral space. And it's almost inviting words to be written on that page. 
And yet the page is also a very dangerous space if you look at it, because it can lead to an overbearing, you know, verbosity of words, a spill out of words and narcissism, which is not what poetry essentially stands for. But as we all know, brevity is the soul of poetry. And, and uh, we want to look at how we can place the poem on a page today. And when we talk about placing a poem on a page, we essentially look at the structure of a poem, whether it's divided into stanzas, stersets, couplets, free verse. If it is a free verse, we then definitely want to study the, the whole craft of line breaks, which I think is today's core, you know, the, the essence of today's session would be uh, the, the use of line breaks in poetry. With that, may I now invite Seth Michelson to talk to us about respecting the page. Over to you, Seth. You're muted. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for welcoming me into this forum. Thank you to Rati Saxena for her vision, energy, and her poetry that she writes and shares and lives, uh, and for making this possible. Thank you, Sukritan Vinita, uh, for your generosity and hospitality and for your beautiful poetry. Uh, I'm so glad to read you and now to be with you here. And I'm honored to be with uh, Subad. Uh, who may be frozen. I don't know, Suad, if you're still with us, um, but I'm so happy uh, and honored to be with all five of uh, us together here today. It's a pleasure. So thank you. And I love this theme for today's talk. At the specific uh, practical level of poetry writing, the, uh, the idea of talking about lineation, of line breaks, uh, and of respecting the page. Uh, and more uh, broadly, uh, of talking about poetry in general, which is an honor and a pleasure and a privilege at a very dangerous and difficult time in the world right now with our pandemic uh, and so many other challenges uh, that we're facing in ourselves and together. Uh, and maybe poetry can help us uh, to be a little bit more inclusive and kind and mutually supportive in, in these times. And if we can locate that down in this conversation today of lineation, of line breaks, then all the better. And of course, we have, when we're talking about lineation, the notion of prosody in an Occidental tradition uh, of thinking about how metrics work, how we can look at uh, units of stress, measuring feet in a poem, if you're familiar uh, with traditional prosody, iams uh, and uh, trochees and dactyls and anapest to count out meter, right? Uh, and we have further innovation on top of that in linguistic terms. Uh, in psychosocial terms. And we have uh, also neuroscience coming into these conversations uh, more recently, which is fabulous and telling us how uh, rhythms can light up the brain with pleasure. And maybe pleasure is the best place to start. And to think about how we make pleasure in poetry and not the pleasure of frivolous fun, but like Vinita said, a serious play uh, that we know uh, uh, makes meaning makes on the meaning page for us, for us. It dignifies our dignifies lives. Our lives. Uh, and respecting the page has to do too, I think, then with thinking about um, the importance, the audacity of speaking, the, the hubris, the arrogance of thinking we could improve upon the blank page. And so maybe that's that sort of first humbling orientation to the work. And I want to talk about this through uh, a couple of poems quickly. Like uh, Vinita said, that uh, brevity is at the core of our craft. Uh, I want to be brief with my comments too and listen uh, more than I speak. So here I've brought two poems that I've chosen both for their brevity because they enact what I think is fundamentally necessary to consider. And that is this paradox of making uh, making presence through absence. So when we, when we hear um, with uh, the orientating quote from Longenbeck that we're organizing sound, that poetry is that organization on the page of sound, I'd like to reflect or extrapolate from that the idea that there's uh, also the necessity of uh, silence. So of making presence from nothing, from silence, something, the immediate arresting pattern. So here's a poem. I'm going to try to share my screen, and please forgive me. It's a beautiful poem. I chose for its brevity, and because you'll see immediately a certain kind of radical lineation on the page. And so here we go, I hope. Entire screen. 
And do you all see my page now? Can you see my page? No, not yet. It says it's sharing my screen. Uh, we can't see it. I don't think any of us can see it right now. No? Can no. You see it now? No? No. 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 Oh, my no. goodness. It says it's Never sharing. Mind. Oh, yes, it's coming. Oh, yes. It's, I think, yes, coming? we can. Yes, it's, it's I think. Poem? Um, just to, yes, we can see it now. Ah, uh, great. So it's a poem by Gwendolyn Brooks, who's a great U.S. poet. Uh, she was born in 1917 and she died in 2000. Very honored uh, and sort of uh, prolific and important poet who talked a lot of, often about race. In this poem, which comes from the Bean Eaters, published in 1960, you can see a radical lineation. It's called We Real Cool. I'm going to read it and then we'll talk about why I've chosen it to talk about lineation. Yeah. We Real Cool. The pool players. Seven at the golden shovel. We real cool, we left school, we lurk late, we strike straight, we sing sin, we thin gin, we jazz June, we die soon. And so you see in this poem, right? There's a radical in gem. The lines are broken off on that personal pronoun we. This is the pleasure of poetry. There's an immediate... Uh, our attention is immediately arrested and there's an immediate establishment of rhythm. The poem's rhythm is making meaning, as Wordworth called it, a meter making argument. So the rhythm is the thing in a certain way. And maybe this is why Sukrita said it's such a wondrous thing to contemplate that we'll maybe never understand because each poem like Langenbeck talks about too, each poem is initiating its own assertion of sound. And what we have differentiating in poetry from the other genres of writing is the line break. And the line break is used to make present that rhythm. And not only that, but what's present, what's made present is an enactment of self and an enactment of community simultaneously. So here we have our internal self connecting with the poet through the machinery of the poem with its immediate assertion through the use of lineation radically of the control of our breath. We're breathing like she wants us to breathe. Our mouth has the pleasure of forming these syllables into sounds that become rhythms that are the rhythms she wants us to feel and have and hear. And it couldn't be possible without the lineation. It would actually be rather dull maybe uh, if we had, let's say, uh, these eight sentences, which are all simple declarative sentences with the Personal pronoun, we. We real cool, we left school, but when we break this, we have we real cool, period, pause. We big pause, where we have to take in a breath. We, And then a new emphasis in that tension that builds between that second we that ends the first line and the word left that begins the second line, right? There's a tension, a dramatic pause. We're waiting to get down there, however much of a millisecond it is. We register this with all of the sophistication of our ear as young readers. We real cool. We left school. She's in our body. We're connecting physically, right, uh, with what we're seeing in this poem. Sorry, I was trying to switch to my next one. And this is making manifest a rhythm that makes manifest a we. The we of the community of readers, who's the we of the speaker, who's the we of the self, who's the we of the pool players, and what's happening to them. Right? And there's a certain kind of use, if you see here, we real cool, double stress. We left school, then another big pause with not only a line break, the enjambment here also spans a stanza break as we work in these couplets. We lurk late, hit hard with that double spondaic foot, the double stress foot. We strike straight again, sing sin, thin gin, jazz june, and then we ultimately die soon. And there's that lament. So it becomes a reflection a melancholic lament for these people who are playing pool and maybe um, prematurely uh, passing. That becomes a broader reflection on our mortality, which ends with the dissipation of sound after two hard stressed syllables. And then on top of that, the finality of a period and then an absence of a we right here. We've come to expect we, 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 we. Then its absence in that final line is a haunting silence. 
or this death resounds because the poetry has enacted it with lineation. And I hope that's one clear example of how poems can bring into presence and then take away, right? Uh, making meaning with lineation. One more, and then I'll, I'll yield to uh, Subhat and hear uh, from what Vinita and, and Sukrita would like to share. Uh, and this is just fa from a great Peruvian poet. And I hope, can you all see this one? I'm hoping you can see the, bra the Black Heralds. This is a translation yeah, by- We can see it, we can see it. Wonderful, thank you for confirming. It's a translation, Cesar Vallejo is a great Peruvian poet who was born in Peru in 1892 and he died in Paris, France, where Subat has read recently. Uh, he died in Paris, France. Um, and this is translated by Rebecca Seiferly, who's a US poet into English as the Black Heralds. And what I wanna pay attention to here is again, lineation and the use of space, sound and silence, including grammar like the ellipses, to indicate the absence of sound as presence and that lineation is making this possible. The Black Heralds, there are blows in life so powerful, I don't know. Blows like God's hatred, as if before them, the undertow of everything suffered were to well up in the soul, I don't know. They're few, but they exist. They open dark furrows in the most ferocious face, the most powerful loins. Perhaps they're wooden horses of barbaric Attilas or black messengers that death sends to us. They're profound lapses of the soul's Christs of some adorable faith that destiny blasphemes. Those bloodthirsty blows are cracklings of some bread that's in the oven's door burns up on us. And man, poor, poor man, he turns his eyes as when a slap on the shoulder calls us by name. He turns his crazed eyes and everything he's lived wells up like a pool of guilt in his gaze. There are blows in life so powerful, I don't know. And in Spanish, this begins, and I'll just tell you so you can hear the beautiful rhythm that evokes absence as presence sonically. Hay golpes en la vida tan fuerte, yo no sé. And you can hear, right, these evocations of absence as presence, that from the absence come these blows. And look at the radical enjambment here. He turns his eyes and we must turn our eyes, swiveling down to the second line of the penultimate stanza, breaking on this very weak part of speech. We know it's a radical and jam, demanding we read through. We're rolling our eyes as this wild beast, right? That's bereaved, afflicted, suffering, agonistic existential despair. And as when a slap, and there comes the slap, there's a relentless pounding at us. It's the pounding of the Attilas. It's the pounding of a blow from God's hatred that we see in line two. And so these are just some of the ways that lineation uh, can evoke meaning and that it varies by the poem. I talk about prison writing in a certain way in a new essay that I just published in a book, a book chapter, uh, about it being emplaced. And I think much is the same of every single poem that we read, the great poems. They emplace us. They immediately create a sonic expectation. And from that manipulation, through our lungs, through our mouths, we produce what the poet intends for us to experience as rhythm. And that rhythm makes meaning, it evokes for us, as we've seen with these kinds of absences as presence, as making us yield, submit to these blows that wildly disrupt like this as here. And like we see with the many we's that bring us into presence only to take it away and leave us in a resounding silence the danger on the page that Vinita talks so beautifully about. I'll stop sharing my screen. I'll return to the group. Thank you so much for this opportunity to begin to converse with you. I look forward to hearing from, from all of you. So, Krita. Great. Um, 
I think it's a very good starter to the debate that you have presented. And, um, you know, I was just thinking, it just made me think very quickly before before we hand over the mic to Shabod. Um, you know, the point is to how every, every poem needs to have its own geography, you know. And that geography, the way that you have the two poems that you have presented, there is a kind of a contrast. One has very many words, quite a few words, but there's a, in both there is a staccato style. And what you talk about, which I love, you know, this whole idea of sonic expectation. Now, what I was thinking was that, you know, even after just the visual part of it, if, even if there is an auditory, internal auditory system at work, as it were, when you're looking at it, you know, um, what you do not see on the page, I mean, there are words on one side, on the rest of it and all around, there is empty space, but it's not empty. That space is not empty. It has a wonderful echo, echo of meaning, echo of experience. In fact, one is not looking for reductively meaning. It is a kind of an echo that you hear internally that's one and it is what is it that makes it possible it is the geography of it the way the poem poet has worked out a mapping of the words on the page and how the words are in consonance with the not words side right there is one side where are words and one side where are there no words but those words are the hidden, concealed kind of sounds which are echoing. Are, they are echoing on the page. And th what makes that possible? The words that are used. So it's a very interesting architecture as well. It's an architecture of the poem. And so um, I was thinking, you know, and I'm not going to go on speaking because I'm getting very excited about it, but just one little example. You know, I, I long time ago, and I very quickly found this just now, I had written a small poem on how to begin. And I'll just read two or three lines from here. This way, that way. It has to surface on this paper. It has to emerge on this vacancy. This way, that way, from those black holes of the universe, seen, unseen, this way, that way, it has to emerge. And I was thinking, you know, as to how the entire creation comes on the page in one sense, through that one little poem that one may feel has come out from some source which may be the black hole you know so it's very interesting to see how images sounds space uh, rhythm how they all come together into a certain kind of aesthetics that de which develops only if we respect the page so both you're welcome <laughs> thank you shukrita Thank you, Vinita. And uh, uh, Rotiji. And Seth Michelson, you, you, you were brilliant. You know, I was, I was really, you know, um, so impressed. You know, I was listening to you and I was forgetting what I planned to say. You know, it was brilliant. And uh, uh, I, I, I will cite only three uh, examples in 10 minutes because I have to get it done within 10 minutes. Uh, three different poems, three categories from three times and uh, different countries. Uh, so before I come to the examples, you know, uh, First, I should tell you frankly and honestly that um, I have been writing poetry for the last 40 years. I wrote my first poem not on a page, not on a white page. I was very young at that time, a school living student, um, yet to enter, uh, I mean, college. And uh, 
I wrote it here. And even this morning I wrote a poem. Uh, and you just think about the 40 years I have been writing. And this morning I have written a poem, which is again, it is here, not in a page. We, we are born with a page here. Lovely. We are born with a page here, and that's the most important thing. And don't consider uh, 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 a paper as a page. Um, you know, I had a poem long ago, 20 years ago, I wrote this poem uh, in which I said that, yes, I can write a poem. It is, it is uh, again, I, am, uh, I, 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 I was very happy to hear. Uh, the title, one title of uh, mm, uh, Saint Michaelson is "Broken Windows," right? Uh, broken windows. So, if uh, I said in that poem that I can write a poem on a piece of ice, on a huge stone, as it was written in ancient times, on the cave. And I can write a poem, the most difficult practice. I can write a poem on a broken window. So respecting a page or ruminating uh, a poem on a white page has always been a challenge, has always been a threat to me. And this, this whiteness of the page, the, 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 the whiteness of the white page, it is so frightening for me, you know. And it is because of this fact, I think possibly because of this, that I try to write. I don't want to look at the whiteness of the page. I write here. Uh, and uh, that, is, that is the process that I have been, you know, uh, I have been doing rather or following rather uh, for so many years. But of course, I have been using laptop. I have been using uh, other devices write poems even 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 i get my poems most of the times when i travel when i walk um, but when i sit down as i'm sitting here this is my writing uh, space you know writing table is here but i hardly write here i write when i am in another room when i walk or just move around then i write so in a way it comes to me like you know it, it, it's not the page the page that we are talking about respecting the page of course i am respecting the page here and everybody has that page so ruminating a design of a poem i always call it a design of a poem because you know even a meter is a design uh i am big pentameter for example was a great design with the romantic poets of england uh or even later in victorian time so in a way, I find that this design of a poem on a white page is not an enigma, but a mathematics of a language. So how you are going to cope with the mathematics of a language? It is not my, uh, not my way of saying it's from Aristotle. So he said that it's a, it's a, it's a language. Language has its own geography. Language has its own mathematics, and also. You, you know the chemistry, that's why you have been writing. So as a practicing writer for 40 years, the whiteness of a white page has always been a threat to me. The first question that comes to me, to my mind, how shall I write the first line? That's very really important for, not only for me, but I think uh, for, for, for Shukritaji, for St. Michaelson, or, or any other poem. I think the first line, the first line is the most important line. That is the beginning. Why, why I, I have asked myself so many times, looking at the first lines of my poems, why did I make it a first line? Why did I, why did I keep it as a first line, uh, first line when I sent it to the praise? Why did I maintain it? There is no answer. There is no answer. It's good that there is no answer. Why, why did I accept the first line as the first line of a poem? So if the first line 
is born. So I believe then it, it, it preconditions the second line and then the second line goes to make the third line and it goes on. But it's not that spontaneous. You have a lot of questions, you have a lot of pauses, you have a lot of thoughts behind your, uh, at, at the back of your mind and then finally you, you, you are settled to write. And sometimes you write so hurriedly, you know. So this is how the lines come to me. But um, um, I have again a very honest question. Uh, do I do I organize the poem according to the meters, or do I do I follow that he has this poem? How how do I how do I know the poem that I will be writing tomorrow morning will be uh, in a meter or in prose? Who is going to determine it? That is a basic question. The way I say the poem, the way it comes here, the way I, I sit, uh, sit down to write the first line or the second line or the third line, they decide the meter. They decide the uh, felicity of diction. They decide the, whether it is going to be noise or, or chaos or order. What it is going to be, uh, because you know that uh, the, 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 the first few lines I'm going to quote from Allen Ginsberg's uh, uh, Howl, which, which was a great poem. And, uh, you know, uh, Alan was, Alan was in Kolkata. And uh, uh, he was living in Kolkata uh, after, after, of course, after he uh, came to India, he was, he came to, Calcutta and he was living in Calcutta. He, he was here for two years. So he, in one of his interviews, he said that I didn't know how I was going to start Howl. And uh, the first few lines came to me. Uh, those were the mad lines or whether I was mad or the lines were mad, I'm not sure about it. And this is how the, the whole madness wanted to, you know, bring the best of me or something like that what he said. But before I come to Allen Ginsberg, I would like to quote just one, one poem. Um, uh, I, I have been quoting this poem, you know, uh, for so many years. That is uh, a poem by uh, Nikanur Parra. Uh, Seth Michelson is, uh, I hope that he is very fond of Nikanur Parra. Uh, and uh, he died very really recently, you know, at the age of 103. And I, I, I spent seven days with Nikanor Parra in, in Bhopal at a, a World Poetry Festival and then, you know, uh, also in Calcutta for two, two three days. So I was, I, was very, I was very young at the time and I was very close to him. And he was every moment, you know, you know every, uh, everywhere, wherever he was taken to, you know, he was writing something in a notebook. Always. I asked him what he was doing. He said, I am, I am collecting, you know, in uh, raw materials. And what is that? Well, yes, raw materials for poetry. I, I, uh, he also said that, yes, I, I cannot keep everything here. So I put it here in my, in my diary, in my notebook. And then when I will go back home in Santiago, I will sit down and then I will make poems out of these raw materials collected from India. So he, say, he said that he had a, he had an, India notebook in his rack, and uh, he wrote some India po Indian poems. In India poems, you can say. So the famous poem is just a three six word poem, and it's only three lines. Uh, U S A. The first line. The second line is where. And the third line is, liberty is a statue. So I, I was quoting this poem everywhere, you know, uh, when uh, uh, Trump was reigning supreme, you know, everywhere. <laughs> and uh, and even in even in Calcutta at so many, you know, uh, festivals, I read this. Oh. Just a minute. Yeah. Uh, so the question is. 
it's 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 fun it's intelligence it's merit it's seriousness and and this this uh, you know the dignity of poetry and that satire so it has it it, it has that it's a realistic kind of poetry but at the same time it is in only six words and he he just he just twisted and nothing else and the poetry was there the poetry was written before before he wrote this poem down the poetry was the poem was was a float everywhere in, not only in in the usa but everywhere but he just collected the poem and put it here so the question is now for a young poet so how can i how can i tell him that go and write a poem like this i never i i never ask any any young poet follow any poet because we know what is the anxiety of influence it's very difficult to come away from that kind of you know that 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 um, uh, what should i say a kind of decaying of soul for a poet you know oh my god i am influenced by him by him by him it's like that you know every time it it's a perennial uh, problem with a poet you know so he said that you were so well liberty is a statue and uh, i told one young poet who look you just imagine that uh, when this poem was written then everybody was mm, laughing even in in new york city before 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 the internet you know uh, before the use of internet became so popular you know in in new york city and it was it was in, uh, in neon light you know it was written uh, in a huge uh, billboard and every 5 minutes it flashed you know you were say well liberty is a statue and everybody standing under under the billboard and they were laughing this is how uh, this poem became so popular you know and uh, strangely enough that the poet himself was living in the new york city at the time with with her with with his sister who, who was a violinist so i believe that this has uh, used the space the white space the blank page in a very uh, in a great way why it is great that when i read this poem i found only three lines and the whole page was blank and it was a long page of a magazine i read first. so so and that that whiteness which was not used by the poet so only three lines only six words in the page and those six words came to me exactly like the billboard as i was talking about i i hadn't seen the billboard myself i i heard about it but you know so it was it was that kind of poem it, it worked like as if we were dropping a bomb on new york city and you just run away so it's like that it happens like that and uh, the the second poem uh, the second example i should say is is again a very famous poem and from uh, a pre romantic poet who was a great poet william blake uh, and as we are all, all of us are teaching so we are well acquainted with uh, Uh, William Blake, and he, he has been uh, considered now in modern time uh, as one of the most significant poets from that time. Not only just a pre-romantic, he can be a post-colonial, a post-modern uh, uh, poet for us. So I just go to uh, just one stanza uh, from that great poem called "Tiger." when the stars threw down their spears and word heaven with their tears did he smile his work to see did he who met the lamp make thee so i as if i am telling this poem to a young poet not to uh, shukrita ji or said michelson you have to give me this opportunity that i am talking to young poets or uh, or my students or maybe students who never came to me 
So we have a regular stanza pattern, which is just opposite to Nicanor Paras poem. No stanza followed by Nicanor Para. It started and finished. But this poem doesn't work like that. It has regular rhyme scheme. It has a regular stanza pattern. You have beautiful space between two stanzas. And the space that gives you uh, the real space of reading the second, then space, reading the third stanza, and it goes on. I never consider this kind of regular stanza pattern as obsolete. Even in modern Bengali poetry, you have the liberty of writing like Nikanur Parada, the poem that I've quoted, or writing like Allen Ginsberg, that long, long prosaic and poetic lines without rhyme, without regular stanza pattern, nothing. And how strange that Allen Ginsberg said in one of his interviews that he was influenced by William Blake, not only by Whitman, but also by William Blake. I, I was totally amazed to read that interview where he confessed that, yes, William Blake influenced me. Is it a vision? Is it something beyond reality that Alan was looking for? The beyond madness running in his house, beyond madness, and he was, you know, traveling all over the world, you know, trying to find peace with Buddhism. And he was terribly afraid of AIDS at that time because I, I met him in New York City in his apartment. Uh, again and again, he said that he was so afraid of uh, AIDS. And, uh, and, you know, I'm not going to explain it why he was afraid. Everybody knows, I hope. And, uh, and, uh, and, 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 uh, he was trying to find uh, peace uh, with uh, even uh, with the icons of Hinduism, and there was an image of Kali. Kali, you know, said Michaelson must be knowing Kali, the goddess, the black goddess, you know, and uh, uh, she is uh, considered to be a goddess of destruction, but uh, but originally she is the goddess of creation at the same time. So, Alan was worshipping Kali in his small apartment. So so he, 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 he was looking for something beyond his time, beyond his reality. As William Blake in, in the pre-romantic time, looking for something very brilliant, something beyond romanticism, possibly. So did he who made the lamp make thee? And that's why I find this a, it's a, this is a unique poem in this sense that it has that beautiful symmetry, not fearful symmetry. It has that beautiful symmetry of meter, of rhyme, and the traditional poetry with unconventional touch of going beyond his own reality. So finally, The first four lines from Howell, Allen Ginsberg. I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by. The line goes on and on, and it you know, uh, it, it comes to my. It, it is it is outside my margin. It goes on. I saw the even. Uh, uh, it reminds us of White, uh, Walt Whitman. But at the same time, it was typical Allen Ginsberg kind of uh, uh, poetry. I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, stirring hysterical naked, dragging themselves through the Negro streets at dawn, looking for an angry fix. 
angel headed hipsters are burning for the ancient heavenly connection to the starry dynamo in the machinery of night. I'm not just going into the theme of the poem. You just, you know, the, 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 the way the words come, it's, a, it's not only just madness, but the madness, you know, so wild, so virulent, and it goes to, you know, every moment it goes to throw, you know, in, in fact, in fact, in fact, a howl was a poem which was, uh, was considered by many to be a, a bomb on America at that time. Because, you know, uh, a lot of people believe that Allen Ginsberg was, was not with the government and who was anti-government and anti-establishment and he was organizing students everywhere, at all uh, U.S. campuses. and. Uh, also organizing students outside USA, in Europe, in, in, in Japan, in India. So this is, you know, he was a different kind of poet. And so his, his protest, the kind of protest that he, you know, we find in this poem, that has been um, a good match for the madness that he was, you know, deeply down into, you know, and this madness made him a great poet, I believe. And so in the page, in the white page, you have a kind of madness, a wild madness in the white page. You cannot put it into any order. It just goes beyond the margins of the whiteness of the page. And that's why it depends on how you are going to accept the whiteness of a page, how you are going to respect the whiteness of a page. You can go beyond the whiteness. You can be within, like William Blake, you can be within the whiteness of the page. And at the same time, your meter, your meter can destroy you and you can destroy the meter. So this is, this is, this is a kind of challenge for uh, the whiteness is a kind of challenge for each and every poet in the world that he has to he has to accept, he has to cope with, he has to understand. So that's why I believe this is a brilliant idea. Uh, by respecting the page, you're ruminating poetry on a white page. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Krista, uh, for this brilliant, uh, brilliant. Uh, idea. And we should, I, uh, I, I, must, I must congratulate Vinita and uh, that um, we always talk about you know you know you know you know you know poetry 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 and sometimes it's it's important for us to think about the structure think about the structure 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 is also it, it's it's like the bones that we have in our body bones we are we cannot have flesh without bones so in a way i again thank you all and i hope that it will continue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, so both. Uh, thank you, so both, Sarkar. That was very illuminating. And uh, I would just like to say that your first example of the three line poem, <laughs> USA, is, is extremely expository of uh, the power of a poem and the brevity yeah. of a poem. And also, um, might I add that when we were talking about respecting the page, the page was used metaphorically. I completely agree with you that the page is here first, and we need to respect that page first. But when a poetry, when when we read poetry and when we go back to poems, we do look at the structure of the poems and how they appear and and how we use them as reference. You know what all the stalwarts have done before us. So in that sense, we would like to respect the page per se, whether it's a digital page or a physical piece of paper. And said you were absolutely brilliant. It was so expansive and vast. And, uh, and I think what really stood out for me from your session was the fact that when you, you, when you said that a poet's line breaks help to manipulate our own lungs, and when we read them out, we are actually being manipulated by the poet to put power into his words through our breath. And that really stood out for me. Thank you both for an absolutely wonderful session. Over to you, Sukrita. Yeah, I think um, uh, you've said it all. And uh, 
Um, there are points to be taken. There are reflections to be done after what we've heard from both uh, Set and uh, Subod. And I think uh, one of the things that was mentioned just now about uh, Subod was talking about how one line in itself directs the next line and the next one and the next one, and it becomes a chain and something takes over. So that's the mysterious part. And yet I would like to add that there is, as you said very rightly, that there is a structure at work. Now that structure, does it come? It doesn't rain from the skies. It's something that is kind of, it, it evolves. It evolves some, somewhere out of sometimes practice, but sometimes some kind of an internal editing, as it were. And that internal editing that happens on the blank page here, you know, I think that is very, very important. We may not consciously be doing it, but as we become more kind of call it seasoned poets, we are not canceling out so much on the page out there, but we are doing it here. The deletions happen, additions happen. Sometimes the whole, whole poem happens there, whether it is a three word poem or a 30 word poem, sometimes all of it happens there, it's complete. And yet my experience of both, if I, I don't yeah. know if you also have similar experiences. I feel the poem is complete. And when I get down to actually putting it on, on the page or on the computer screen, it transforms itself at times. What happens? Yeah. It's a translation that takes place, you know, a yeah, translation yeah, sure. of the internal right. to the external. And when that translation takes place, you are not unhappy about it because the poem is not <coughs> there as it is, yeah. as, the, as the baby also right. forms itself slowly, you know, and it grows. And then when you're writing, you're making changes. You're, some things are happening. You can't help it. You can't produce it as it is. So strange it remains, no matter how much we try to work it out. And two plus two in mathematics is not always four, I have been taught. There is some <laughs> kind of a fuzzy logic at work. And that fuzzy logic is what goes into the making of a poem. <coughs> But for that fuzzy logic to be there, logic has to be understood. That's the irony. We have to understand what logic is in order to build up from there the idea of fuzzy logic. Thank you so, so much. I think, I, think, I think what Sukrita is saying, and, and I would just like to sum it up in a sense, that uh, the rules need to be understood before they can be broken. And, right. and yeah. the kind of examples we had from Seth and from Subodh were extremely varied. We had five poems which we looked at today. Each was extremely distinct from each other. And yet they, 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 were, they were these great examples of line breaks and structure <coughs> and the form of the poem, which just goes to say that everything works provided you master the craft of making it work. And I think Rati would like to have a... I would like to say yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, Rupiji. Uh, actually, um, I'm not a scholar like you people. You are the <laughs> poet, your teachers, professors, and all. Uh, what I want to say that Vedic age is the ancient age when the poetry was not written. It was shruti. Yeah. It was always spoken, and you know that sure. there were three things to be mentioned before any richa. And three of them were very, very, very important, equally important. One was the Rishi, the poet, whose his name. Second was the Devata, for whom this poetry is written. It could be Dundubhi, it could be Indra, it could be Vayu, it, it could be diseases also. And yeah. third, was well, most important thing is the Chandas, means the rhythm. Even yeah. they were writing in their brain, they have to follow those chandas. They, the, the Vedic poetry was not written for years and years. Yeah. After a long time only, in a Brahmana uh, uh, time only, they, they were used for the rituals. 
so what <clears throat> what in um, in sanskrit because there are two type of literature we find one is the vedic literature and second is the classical in classical literature everything is very systematic everything is very uh, what you say the hygienic and beautiful and but vedic means very raw ideas very raw poetry if you read their poetry it is very raw it's like a native americans uh, reading their um, rituals almost like that uh, like shamanics are rich, uh, reading their rituals but they had chandas so that is there in brain so what i feel that your your theme is very important in modern time also but same time both of them luckily faith and subodh are talking about two dimension of same thing and both dimension we find from very early age from where we have started poetry so uh, thank you very much i enjoyed a lot and many are enjoyed so uh, over thank to you, you subodh and vinita <laughs> thank you so thank i think you. what what uh, what what rati the point that she is making is that cadence and rhythm are extremely important elements in poetry and perhaps we could look at cadence and rhythm in a separate session uh, when we do our ruminating poetry sessions because uh, i completely agree with you rati that cadence and the, and that is what makes you you know memorize a poem makes it easy to memorize a poem and even in modern uh, times we do uh, lay a lot of emphasis and stress on on the rhythm and the, and the sound of a poem so the sound of a poem is one separate session altogether i think so do we open the house to oh, questions and answers from our audience that would be wonderful no everyone is uh, liking very much like uh, 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 this is the question what uh, they really, uh, because they are not showing the face here these wonderful observation sukrit translation because every, everyone even uh, um, yes. uh, i like the maina uh, uh, elfin has said Uh, that as well language uh, poet living in a uh, english daily means they are using two languages so th- when you talk about the writing on the window broken window so both so he said that uh, we we always say there two windows but sometimes one is frosted and one is forever cracked <laughs> and uh, um, uh, 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 bankbird is also saying that uh, because i don't know why they are not showing their name here uh, so that uh, as i am living in a cold weather in sweden i can write a poem on ice on the window so window is a very actually this became a very interesting um, uh, in a uh, mostly i think and most set yeah set's poem was titled ice like broken windows am i right set and would you like to add anything to what you've yeah. said earlier that make any additions sure i mean this is A, a beautiful conversation in uh to join our welsh friend uh in to join our swedish friend talking in this way if we go back to subod's uh, citation of nicnor parra he says in poesia se permite todo so in poetry everything is permitted yeah and exactly. if we come right and so he's yeah. taking down cool. daily speech Uh, that he's notating in his books from india from anywhere he is every day he would sit in cafes famously uh in santiago and just eavesdrop and write down which is to remind us that mm-hmm. these rhythms these rhythms that what donald justice a great us poet who was a formalist actually he wrote and received forms working through and against those forms rebelling like we need to said knowing the rules to break them to make meaning to expand possibility a visionary in 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 that sense uh so that a poem must be filled with a maximum amount of wildness and that wildness comes from the sort of conjuring of rhythm and then marshaling that rhythm through or following the transformations of that rhythm from line to line lineation can help us to make that rhythm happen and so when we hear ginsberg in subod's beautiful introduction uh, to ginsberg's work through how he says i hear the uh best minds of my generation destroyed by madness this long loping melancholic yeah. dystopic uh opening line that lays forth a geography to use greek's uh, terminology and within yeah. that geography it's a geography i would say of music and it's the musicality of uh blending the absence it's as simple as the absence and presence of sound and how is that manipulated 
And it's everywhere. It's not sort of the domain of poetry. It's in everything we do. It's in advertisements. You hear jingles on the, the radio or television. It's, uh, right? it, it's in fiction. Uh, it, it's in conversation, like Norpara reminds us. Uh, and it's in sacred language too, like Rati reminds us. When I think of a uh, dystopic uh, cosmovision of Ginsburg, who struggled with his Judaism and he struggled with his Buddhism and he struggled existentially to think about how uh, to conceive of, uh, of human presence in the universe, and there, there's an echo from the ancient Hebrew uh, of the mourner's yeah, Kaddish, yeah. because he writes his famous Kaddish too, his dystopic Kaddish. In the yeah. Kaddish begins in Hebrew, you hear the rhythm. Like Subod said, the first line lays it down. Out of nothingness comes some original rhythm that makes meaning. And it's tireless in its uh, wondrous possibilities yeah. as a poet to think about what these rhythms can make meaning. when. Sukrita told us right earlier, it's an, an endless questioning that we're after because every poem varies. And that Kaddish in Hebrew would open, Yitkadal v'yitkadash shemei rava. You don't need to know Hebrew to hear the rhythm being made and then broken. The regularity that's then interrupted beneath this point of establishing a rule to break a rule. Like Miles Davis playing jazz, you introduce a melody to then break the melody or to play it slower or faster, uh, to turn it around. Uh, to interrupt or disrupt. And that leaves us with this resounding that paradox, the resounding silence that we see at the end of Gwendolyn Brooks' poem with the absent we that's not in the last line. After seven lines ending, we, 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 nothing. And there's that, that's that mindscape. That's another Chilean poet, Tsuban. When your mind is the blank page, you know, Raul Zurita, another great Chilean poet and contemporary of Nicolás Parras, who was younger than Parra, because Parra, of course, dies at 103 years old because poetry yeah, makes yeah. It healthy. Poetry keeps it well. Uh, we can all live, hopefully, 103 years of healthy life. But he wrote poetry in the sky. He had his poems made by airplanes in, in sky writing and then making present to dissolve back into the sky, into the universe. He wrote in the Atacama Desert poetry that you could see from the sky, a different kind of page, the windswept desert that ecologically will erase in its own way those, those words that were attempted to be inscribed on the surface of the blank page. Uh, so it's a very beautiful process and I'm so joyful in my heart to be with you and conversing about this today and to all of those adding to our conversation through the internet, through their comments from uh, Wales from Sweden. So thank you to everybody. It's a, a joy to be with you. So I you really need to, what I was recalling was, and this is something significant, I have been, um, uh, uh, you know, one of our very, very important writers, Krishna Sophie, passed away about a year ago. And um, I was uh, having a lot of conversations with her. And very interestingly, in one of the conversations she told me, she said, look, for me, the page is never blank. The moment I sit down in the middle of the night, and I always write in the middle of the night, when I look at the page, there are words and images that start flowing. It's never a blank page. And all I'm doing is to cut out on the page images and, um, and and the words, because I want to make it brief. So the whole <laughs> process gets inverted to her, for, and as far as she's concerned. And she's a prose writer, but each of her novels, no, not each yeah, of her yeah, novels, yeah, but yeah. at least one of the most important novels begins with a long poem. And she says it happened, that poem happened only because just as I was going to write, uh, there was a, a sound of azan. And we're talking about sonic context, you know? And that sound in her mind said, oh, I cannot write, I cannot write prose. It has to be a poem. And words were flowing out of the page. And, you know, even if you're saying that it is so conscious, the process, I always say, the process is very conscious. Writing of poetry is very conscious. But what, what is this unconscious doing there? It just keeps up, it props itself up and interacts with the conscious in such a way that the conscious lies flat and the unconscious is writing for you, you know. <laughs> it's something very strange and all these contrasts That's very well said. able to understand. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So uh, That's very I'm very, well really grateful to um, 
upset you and uh, um, also to Subodh. I don't know where he's disappeared, but he seems to come and go. He's playing hide and seek with us, you know. So, uh, so he and of course, uh, Rati, I'm sure Vinita and I are very, very grateful to you for having given us this platform because this conversation, which is really the first conversation we are having, uh, which is in a way, this is the inaugural session. And in this session, uh, we found many or many other kind of subjects and themes that we would like to deal with in our coming programs. And I'm sure we are going to develop newer ideas and better and better should it become as we go along. Thank you so much, yes. everyone. Thank you. And as a last line, uh, I would like to say that uh, we want to make this as interactive as possible, uh, as much as a learning experience for our viewers as it is for us when we hear our experts talk. So please be free with your questions. Please approach us with the new topics that you might want to hear about. And uh, to conclude, um, for respecting the page, I feel that there is this poem by William Strafford, Traveling in the Dark, which is one of my absolute favorite poems. The use of line breaks out there is outstanding. So I request all poetry lovers to go to that poem and read it once, keeping in mind this, this session, respecting the page. It's been a privilege listening to you, Seth and Subodh. Rati, thank you for the platform. Thank you all. Thank you, Sukrita. Thank you Summarizing. very much. Uh, this is, you are making a Kritya movement really useful, worthful, and very interesting. I thank you both, um, Sukruta and Vinita. And I thank you, my brother, um, uh, Seth Michelson, uh, uh, Michaelson, uh, who has translated my poetry from Hindi to directly in English. You know that without knowing the Hindi language. <laughs> and he was counting my words. Uh, when I be, I remember when I was, he asked me to read those poems, and he was counting my lips. Oh. Uh, movement uh, and oh. then he was he asked me the meaning just ordinary meaning in english and then with those uh, uh, this, uh, uh, lip reading and the the no i think he was counting the numbers also uh, uh, spaces syllables. also and then syllables and everything he was counting and then he translated which was very close to uh, my extremely close to my original translation and it was the best translation in my life. Uh, anyway, wow. this was I I told this thing because this helped. This uh, uh, what you say that we need in in it, uh, in Sanskrit we call matra counting the matra, mm -hmm. uh, not syllable. In in a South Indian language we count the syllable. In Sanskrit we count the uh, uh, numbers. So he was counting the numbers, which is still useful. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and and I, will, I, think, uh, I think we would like to also thank all the people who joined us in the sense that, you know, I could yes, see thank that you so much for watching. the Welsh poet and the Swedish one. And also I just saw uh, Usha's remark. Usha yeah, Usha was there. Yeah, yeah. So, so thank you us. for joining Those us. Good. And thank you all the others. And it would be lovely to have, as Vinita rightly put it, I think we need more suggestions, more ideas. And it will be lovely to have you in our programs more and more. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>